Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. We now move on to question 3 and question 4 of the May-June 2022 CXE Mathematics Pass Paper. Let's get right into it. Now, question 3 says, Diagram below shows four shapes, P, Q, R, and S on a square grid. Alright, so we have P, Q, S, and R. Now, by just looking at this grid right here, we should realize that we are really looking at transformation geometry, right? And there are several things that you need to know. You need to know your reflection, your rotation, your enlargement, and so on. Very important. So let's get right into the questions. Now, the first one says, describe fully the single transformation that maps P onto shape Q. So I'm going to go back to my previous page, and I'm going to be looking at P and shape Q. All right? Now, clearly, you can see that this is a rotation. By just looking at it, it was set this way then it went all the way around here it is a rotation now notice that the angle that it uh, would have turned through because let's take for example this line right here when if this was 90 degree you'd have gone vertical right and then once it comes back flat that gives me a 180 degree so by just looking at this we know that this is a 180 degree as you can see it turned all the way around let's look at it good now, in describing a rotation, there are several things that I need to know. I need to know the center of rotation, the angle of rotation, and clearly the angle of rotation is 180 degrees, and of course we need to know the direction, and this is the direction that the clock goes, right? So we say it is clockwise. Now, what makes this particular rotation very easy to describe is that the two objects are still touching each other, all right? Or I should say that the object, which is P, is touching the image, which is Q. This is what it means. Because both of them are touching, if we can find a point that remains the same, then that point automatically is the center of rotation. So if by just looking at this diagram right here, if I were to come right here to this point, notice that in the object, this point is right here. When the image was formed, it is the same point on the image that has remained the same. Now, this is the beauty. The point of rotation can never be changed. And the fact that this point hasn't changed any at all, it means that that point is the center of rotation. If that weren't the case and we couldn't find a common point, then of course we would have to connect the corresponding points on the object and on the image and find a perpendicular bisector of any two connected points. And where those two lines cross would be your center of rotation. But in a case like this, it becomes very easy. Now, if you don't believe us, we could use our compass to test this. So I'm going to pull in my compass here. Okay, let's go. Now, we said that because this point never changed, this point automatically is my center of rotation. And we can actually prove that, right? So let me take the compass point and I'm going to put it right here. Now, if this is the center of rotation, whenever I swing an arc from any point, it would automatically end up on the corresponding arc on the image. So... Let's start with this point right here. Okay, let's go. So I'm gonna swing my, my arc all the way around. Bam, look at where it goes. It goes from this point, to the corresponding point over there. Now, just to be safe, let us try a second point. Let us take it back around here. I'm gonna condense my compass. Uh, this can't be condensed anymore. Okay, let me take it back around to this point. All right, extend this a bit, bring this down. All right, there we go. All right, let's swing our arc now. Notice what happens? They correspond. So automatically, I know that this is my center of rotation. Let's find the coordinate of that. We go to the x-axis first, which on the x-axis, that is going to be 7. On the y-axis, it is 7. So I'm going to go to my next page to write my description because I have everything I need. So my next page. All right. So we're going to put a proper description there. And we say Q is a rotation of P through the center. And of course... We know that the center, um, or I could say through 180 degrees. Let me put it like that. Through 180 degrees with 
center be in the coordinate. So I put that in coordinate form. 7 center. 7, 7. And what am I missing? The direction. So I should probably say 180 degrees clockwise. Yeah, clockwise. All right, you could probably put it in a much better paragraph right there. So we have a full description of that right there. Now I'm going to be looking at how P turns into R. So I'm going to go back to my previous page. Now look at P, look at R. All right, let me just clean this off so we're not distracted by the lines on the diagram. All right, I have P here and I have R here. Now notice what is unique about these two. P, which is the object, and R, which is the image, are facing each other. All right? The very fact that they're facing each other, the size is still the same. It can only mean it's a reflection. Now, reflection is easy to remember because we always look in the mirror. And once we look in the mirror, we undergo what is called lateral inversion, as you can see right here. So, I know this is a reflection. They're both facing each other. If you're not sure, what you can do is try to bend the paper so that they overlap. Now, in describing my reflection, I need to find the line of reflection. So, I'm going to have to find a line that I bend that will make these two overlap. And normally, that line is right in the center. So, we can simply count the spaces in between. So, I could say we have one, two, three, four spaces in between. So, it means that half a four is two. So, that midway line or that mirror line be two points away, right? So, I'm going to choose this right here. Or I can choose, let me start with the object and count one, two. What it means is that this right here is my line of reflection. All right, so I'm going to draw the line here, or right, this is my mirror line. So let me get that out. Let me get that done properly. Start here, go all the way down the line. That is my mirror line. Now, and if, I probably need to remove this here so you can see clearly what we are saying. This might be a bit distraction. distracting down here. Now, let me put it there for now. Now, for this to be easier for you, what you can do is bring the line all the way down. Let's bring it all the way down to the x-axis. Good. Uh, not good. All the way down to the x-axis. Now, notice that this line would actually cut the x-axis at the point 1. And that's the equation. x is equal to 1. So, we can say that r is a reflection of p in the line x equal 1. Alright? Pretty easy description there. So let's go back to the next page and we say that R, and I'm going to write that in right here, R is a reflection of P in the line x equal 1. All right. I don't have the best handwriting as you can see, but that's pretty much all we need to describe a reflection. Now we're going to look at P and S. So we have to go back to our previous page. Let me see if I can get this up some more. All right, no, I'm going to put it at the top over here, probably. Let's move this over here. All right, good. Now let's look at P and S. Clearly, there is one thing that stands out here. The size has changed. P was this size, of course. P got larger, as you can see here, to turn into S, which is my image. So, if it's getting larger, it's naturally going to be an enlargement, right? Now, what do I need to describe an enlargement? I need what is called the scale factor. In other words, what do I multiply the first object, or what do I multiply the object by to get the image? All I have to do is choose a corresponding point, right? Or a corresponding side, to be more specific. So, let's look at this side. This side correspond. Now, if we look at the box here, this takes up one box, this takes up two boxes. So I'm asking myself, what do I multiply this by to get this down here? Clearly, to get two from one, we multiply by two. So we know that the scale factor is equal to two. That is down. I need the center of enlargement. So let me clean this up. All right, let me get everything else off the page. So we need a scale factor. And we need a center of enlargement. There is nothing else you need to describe an enlargement. Now, how do I get the center of enlargement? What I have to do is that I have to choose corresponding points. And I'm going to be using a line to connect them. Now, wherever these two lines intersect, or intersect means wherever they cross each other, that is your center of enlargement, right? So, I'm going to be using that one, that one. I'm going to be using a yellow, 
just to make the point right there. Good. So those are the corresponding points. So let's go ahead and draw a line. So I want to draw a line from, let me use red, from all the way down here through its corresponding point up here. And I want to make sure that it goes right through the point all the way up. Right. I could probably even make that a bit longer if I need to. And I'm going to go to this point now and I'm going to do the same thing. So from all the way down here, all the way up, 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 up. Wow, I don't even need to extend the lines. Now let me use a yellow dot. There we go. Right here, they would intersect right here. That is my center of enlargement. All right, and remember you read the x-axis first, so we come down that is 7. And then we come up, we go to the y-axis, that is 11. So I'm going to go to my next page now. Now let's write a proper description, right? So S, let me go for red, or let's go blue. S is an enlargement of P by scale factor, scale factor 2. And if you want, you could put the scale factor in a matrix form. Hmm? 2, 0, 0, 2. But because we have, because the center, and the issue with this is that the center would not be 0, 0 at the origin, right? So this wouldn't work. All right? So let me take that out. So if the center was 0, 0, that could work. And center, and I put this in coordinate form, 7, 11. All right? Remember to put your x coordinate first, and then you put your y coordinate. And that pretty much wraps up my enlargement. Now going down here, it says on the grid, draw the image of shape P after a translation by the vector negative 2, 3. All right, that, that is not going to be hard. I'm just going to go back and write that down there. All right, let's clean up all of this. Now translating just means that you take the object. It's going to be facing the same direction. All you do is move it with a coordinate, right? So then the coordinate was negative 2, 3, which means that you're going to take each point, move it two places, negative 2, this is your horizontal movement, right, or your x movement. And down here, 3 is your y movement or your vertical movement. So negative 2 means two places to the left, and 3 means three places up. So we're going to do that with all the points. This is how we do it. Let's start with this point. So we need to go two places to the left. So we'll go 1, 2. And 3 means 3 places up. 1, 2, 3. We'll put a point there, right? And let's use a different color so it doesn't get hidden. Alright. We're going to do the same thing with this point here. We're going to go 2 to the left. And 3 up. So 1, 2. And 1, 2, 3. We can do the same thing with this point right here. So we're going to go two places to the left and three up. So one, two, one, two, three. Right there. All right. We're going to do the same thing with these points. Of course, you don't have to do every point because once you start drawing the thing, it becomes straightforward. What do I mean by that? All right. Let's get some ink. We're going to connect this point here to this point out here. Right, so we have the top of the diagram, right? Clearly, this is one unit up. So I'm going to take that one unit up. Once again, probably I need to use the next color so you can see it clearly. I'm going to take it one unit up. This goes one to the left. We'll go one to the left as well. Right, so we have two units down. We go two units down. And of course, once I have that, I just need to connect the front part to the back part. And they said that we should label this T. So we're going to put a T in this. So of course, there are some skills you can use. You don't have to count every single point. Once you get an idea of where the thing is going to fall, you can actually replicate it. All right. And as you can see, they're facing the same direction and they're the same size. Translation doesn't change the orientation or the size of the object. And that brings us to the end of question number three. All right. So we go next and next to question number four. All right, right now we're looking at what we call functions. It says the function f and g are defined as follows. 
f of x is equal to 5x plus 7 and g of x is equal to 3x minus 1. For the given function above, determine g of 1 third. So we know that g, g of x is equal to 3x minus 1. I'm going to write g of 1 third here so you can see what happens. What they did is to simply take the x that you have here as the input, replace that with 1 third. So what it means is that when you go into the function, you put back everything apart from the x. That x is going to become 1 third and you put that in a bracket, right? Now, of course, you can work this out in your head. You know that 3 thirds give you a whole. You subtract 1, you get 0, all right? But if you're not feeling confident, once again, go to your calculator. Let me clear this out. And you can put all of this in there. So 3, open bracket. You want 1 third, you press 1, fraction bar, 3. You close the bracket, you subtract 1, equal, and that's 0. Not too bad. All right, let's take this down. F inverse of minus 3. All right, let's do this the easy way first. Now, what happens when you inverse a function? When you inverse a function, technically speaking, you reverse a function from the y back to the x. Because normally, you put in the x values to get the y value. But when you do the reverse, you're putting in the y values technically to get out the x values. So when I'm finding f inverse of minus 3, the inverse function means that I would have plugged minus 3 into the inverse function to get out the corresponding x value. But guess what? If that is true, it makes it easy for me to simply take the f function, which is 5x plus 7, and simply equate it to minus 3. That is a short and easy way to do it. We simply inverse, we simply equate the original function, which is f of x. We simply equate f of x to minus 3. So, this becomes a linear equation, which is, simple, which is going to be pretty easy to solve. So, the 7 is positive. It comes over as a subtraction, right? So, you have 5x is equal to minus 3, minus 7. 5x is equal to minus 10. We divide both sides by 5 x is equal to minus 2. But remember, we're not finding x. Where this minus 2 here represents f inverse of minus 3. So we're going to say f inverse of minus 3 is equal to negative 2. That, of course, is what we call the shortcut way of approaching this question. Now, we can always do it the long way, which the long way is that we're going to have to take the function, so let me take out all this, and find the inverse of it. So we can say, start by saying f of x is equal to 3, no, f of x is equal to 5x plus 7, all right? Then we can say, let y equal 5x plus 7. To find the inverse, we interchange x and y, right? So we have x equal 5y plus 7. And then we're going to solve for y. So we do it just like a normal equation. We get rid of a plus 7 first. It's positive, so it comes over as a negative. x minus 7 is equal to 5y. 5 is multiplying the y. We divide both sides by 5. So y is equal to x minus 7 over 5, which this represents my inverse function. So I'm going to say f inverse of x is equal to x minus 7 upon 5. Good. So I want f inverse of minus 3, which means I'm going to replace this x by minus 3. So minus 3 minus 7 over 5. Now, what is minus 3 minus 7? That's minus 10 over 5, which is equal to minus 2. This, of course, is a longer way of doing this question. All right. But I always want to quick keep it quick and short. Use less time. All right. Scroll this down. We'll go to the next page. All right, and here it says the line L is shown on the grid below. All right, we can see the line. Now let's scroll this down, see what they want. Write equation of a line in the form y equal mx plus c. Let's clarify some things. m is equal to the gradient. And c is equal to y intercept. Simply means where does the line cut the y-axis? Clearly, we can see that this line cuts the y-axis at 1. So we know that c is equal to 1. So we have y 
I, I can tear this down. We don't need all of this space right here. So I'm going to have y is equal to mx plus c. c is clear to me. It cuts the y-axis at 1. So I'm going to have plus 1. All right? So y is equal to, the only thing I need to put in is the gradient. Remember, we don't change the variables. x and y remains. All right? Now, what is my gradient? Remember that your gradient is equal to rise over run. Good. So I'm going to simply choose two points on my line that I can simply see clearly. Good. And this point here. So I'm going to measure the rise and run that takes me to this point. So look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a triangle on the line. So I just need to go up one position, one unit, and then I'm going to go across one, two, three units. So my rise here from one to two is one. So we're going to put that down, my rise. So it's rise, which is one, over my run, which is one, two, three. So my equation is y is equal to one third x plus one, and you're done. All right, let's take this down and see if we have a next question on this page. Or oh, it says go to the next page, all right? So we're going to go next. All right, let's see. The equation of a different line, Q, is y equal minus 2x plus 8, right on the coordinate of the point where it crosses the x-axis. Now, what is the beauty about this? We know that when a line crosses the x-axis, your corresponding y value is 0. If you go back to the previous page, look at this line. This line crosses the x-axis at minus 3, which means when you come across on y, the y value is always going to be 0. So we know that y is equal to 0. Good. So if y is equal to 0, then negative 2x plus 8 is equal to 0. We want the coordinate, which means we want both the x value and the y value. So let's solve this. This is positive 8. So we're going to have minus 2x is equal to 0 minus 8. Positive comes over as a negative. Minus 2x is equal to minus 8. We divide both sides by minus 2. So x is equal to 4. All right? Please don't forget your minus signs. I almost did. Now we want it as a coordinate, which means we want the x coordinate first, which is 4. Corresponding y coordinate is 0. All right. Write down the coordinate of where the... Q crosses the y-axis. Remember, the beauty about the equation of a line, which is y equal minus 2x plus 8, is that the line itself contains the y-intercept, which is this value here, the c-value. So I know what the y-value is going to be already. But when the line cuts the y-axis, y-axis, the x-value now becomes 0. So we know that the x-value is 0, and we already know that the y-intercept is 8. So my coordinate is 0, 8. All right? This is a question you don't get wrong. All right, let's go all the way down. It says, on the grid on page 14, draw the graph of the line Q. Hmm, draw the graph of line Q. Guess what? It became so easy because we have two points on the line already. And that's all you need to draw a line. We have 4, 0 and 0, 8. So let's go back. Let's take this down. Good. 4, 0. So I find 4 on the x-axis. 0 is going to be there. That's 4, 0. And I also have 0, 8. So uh, 0, 8, 0 on the x-axis. All right, let me go back just to make sure it's 0, 8. Right. Next. Yes, 4, 0, and 0, 8 previous. So we have 4, 0 there, and then 0, which is 0 on the x-axis, and 8 on the y-axis is going to be there. So I can draw my line. Let's, let's make this line red. All the way down. And of course, I'm going to label the line, right? This is line Q. All right, let's go back. Next. Next. Okay, I think I have a next question down here. It says, complete the statement below. According to the graph, the solution of the system of equations consisting of L and Q is. 
when it says a solution, it means we are told that the both lines are equal to each other. All right, what do I mean? At what point are both lines equal to each other? Which means that there is going to be a point on this graph where both lines will have the same coordinates. The only point where they can have the same coordinates is where they touch. Let me take out this here so it doesn't confuse you. Good. So all I'm looking for is where do these two lines meet? They meet right here. And the coordinate of where they meet is at 3, x value always comes first, and 2 on the y axis. Alright, so that's 3, 2. So, there we go. The solution system is going to be 3, 2. Alright, and if you want to look at it, think of it as a simultaneous equation. x is equal to 3, y is equal to 2. That's like a simultaneous system using the graphical method. Alright, and of course... Normally, persons normally say questions where you have to use like elimination or substitution, or even the matrix method. The graphical method, of course, is where you draw the lines, and where they meet is the solution. All right, so this was a good question, and that brings us to the end of my fourth question. Thank you for watching.